Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the 2020 Federalist Society Symposium. This year, our topic is regulating big tech. Uh, we, have a, we have a couple of really interesting panels for you, as well as a uh, keynote by FTC General Counsel Alden Abbott. Um, it, it should be a, 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 it sh should be an interesting day. Um, we hope you'll make it to our to our later panels as well. This panel here is titled "Do We Need to Rethink Antitrust for Big Tech?" Um, I'm sure that you're all familiar with calls uh, to rein in big tech companies. People say that there's unfair competition, that 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 they're monopolies, and this is a, a very active debate. Um, moderating our panel today is Professor Christopher Yu, the John H. Chestnut Professor of Law here at Penn Law School. He's one of the nation's leading authorities on law and technology and one of the most cited uh, people in admin law, regulatory law, and intellectual property law. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, and he worked at Hogan and Hartson before teaching at Vanderbilt Law and now at Penn Law. Here, he is the director of the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition, one of the co-sponsors of the, of the event. Um, and in addition to uh, being a faculty advisor of the Penn Law Federalist Society, he's also been a fantastic personal mentor. Uh, this symposium, this symposium would not have been possible without his help. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, Professor Yu, uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Marco, for your kind words. And I want to thank you and the other members of the chapter for pulling this together, and frankly, being such a model uh, chapter in the Federal Society world. For those of you who weren't here last year, uh, you may not know that um, the, this chapter was awarded the Benjamin Franklin Award for being a model chapter and is it, or all its accomplishments, which is a tribute to this membership of all of it and the support. And as we all know, these organizations only go as far as the students who make it. Um, and it's something that by their nature, we have to reinvent ourselves every three years, and so uh, completely. And so I think uh, that seeing the room here and uh, Seeing so many familiar faces and some, even some former graduates who come back, is delighted to see uh, Marcus. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's really quite gratifying. Uh, I also love the topic of this panel, and it's fascinating to me because if we were having this conversation about ten years ago, it was very common to say antitrust is dead. Uh, let's say that's not true anymore. Um, and interestingly, not just not antitrust is dead, but. Big tech was, if you will, the darling, the model of everything that was good about American industry and were the examples held up to the entire world about how to do it right. And everyone, in I, all the international students I, said, I met would say, how can we create a Silicon Valley in my country? Uh, the rhetoric has changed dramatically. And um, there's an organization called the International Competition Network where uh, it's, the, it's, it's the global gathering of antitrust regulators where Roger and I were last year, and uh, Salil has been what we call a non-governmental advisor there as well. And I will tell you, the, court, the discourse there is, uh, it's a given that they're all going to do something. There's a certain uh, tone of ready, shoot, aim. Uh, they didn't really need theories. They didn't really need data. They were determined to move forward because I think there was a lot of uh, pressure to it. And I think what we're seeing now is a much uh, better discourse because uh, many of these authorities have to go to court to make their case. And they have to figure out how they're going to do that. And so we have a panel today really to set up the start part of that discourse to analyze how things are going in big tech and antitrust. And I can't imagine a better trio of people to help discuss things. Uh, we'll start, uh, we'll do this for no better reason. And I say this in, with great ambivalence because whenever I do this, I always end up at the end. We'll go in alphabetical order, which everyone says is the neutral fair way to do us. And all of us who are wise and Z's clearly don't feel that way. But um, Roger Alford, uh, Roger is the former Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division in charge of international affairs. Uh, I uh, had the great pleasure of reconnecting with Roger at, a at the major competition law conference in China. 
where um, we, we saw speaking, him, exactly. you were speaking, and I was delighted to see him call. He was nice enough to mention my name from the chair during his remarks, uh, more or less impromptu. I'm sure that wasn't in the remarks you cleared with the division. It was. You got the, it was. It was. How nice. Well, I'm flattered. Uh, what, uh, actually, uh, Roger and I go way back because we were associates together at what was then called Hogan and Hartston, now called Hogan Levels, sitting a few floors down on the same floor. And so um, it's funny to me how these things work out. But I can't, given his leadership in a wide number of areas, particularly in the, what the, uh, the major due process initiative that's been working its way through uh, the International Competition Network, it's been a significant contribution to, I think, making things work much better everywhere. Um, Jay Himes is our second speaker. He is a partner at Leviton and Sukarov. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Close enough. Close enough. Mm -hmm. um, and he bring, uh, it brings a wealth of experience, but in particular, uh, uh, a viewpoint that's often not represented in these, in these panels. Um, Mr. Himes was the lead antitrust enforcement authority for the New York Attorney General's office. And that is a growing area, a much more interesting area than has been the case uh, in, historically. And uh, also it has represented com uh, different actors in a wide variety of antitrust matters, is active in the American Antitrust Institute and other venues that are absolutely essential. And then our third speaker will be Salil Mera, who's a professor at, uh, at Temple here in town. Uh, Salil also is a veteran of the antitrust division. Um, and in addition, I actually love Salil's work because it looks at tech companies in a very grounded way. Uh, two of my personal favorites, he actually looks at Wikipedia and tries to understand what it needs to succeed and sees if it will scale and sustain in ways that we've seen less so in the English speaking parts, but definitely in the foreign language speaking parts about what, it's very easy to see, oh, here's a new model of how we can do things. Uh, that doesn't just happen, and to understand that better. And what his, literally, my fav one of my favorite titles of any Law Review article I've ever read is that, uh, is Paradise is a Walled Garden. Mm -hmm. And um, this ties very much into the question of vertical integration in the internet space. And he says it actually not from a terribly sympathetic idea that paradise, is, that he's not advocating for walled gardens, but etymologically the word paradise literally comes from, is it Persian? The Persian words for walled garden, because back then when you were rich enough, you enclosed your own land and had your own private space. I thought it was one of the most clever titles I'd seen <laughs> in a law review article in my life. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, uh, with that introduction, I will stop talking and turn the floor over to Roger. Please uh, 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 feel free. We've said 10 minutes each, then I'll give you a chance to respond to anything you might have uh, heard from the others, and then we'll get to a Q&A. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, Chris and I were friends when the newly minted lawyers uh, at Hogan, uh, Hogan Hearts and now Hogan Levels, and we've kept in touch over the years, and it's been just delightful to see your um, your trajectory and your career development. Penn obviously is one of the great leaders of um, antitrust teaching. I mean, you've got Herb Hovenkamp, uh, Aviv Nebo, uh, Christopher Yu, and, and numerous other faculty members. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, it would definitely be the envy of every other law school in terms of if you could have those three people in any other law school, you would be extraordinarily happy for antitrust. And as you said, Chris, you know, antitrust has been essentially on cruise control for a long time. I wouldn't say that people would say it was dead. It was just more sort of, it had been on cruise control. It was, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm about researching it or enforcing it or studying it. It was, you know, for several decades, it would be relatively quiet in terms of uh, public perceptions, but now it is just absolutely exploding on the scene. It is really, really a prominent, prominent area of discussion. Uh, in the United States, for sure, definitely in the rest of the world, uh, in Europe, it is a very, very prominent topic. And so it is just a huge, huge area of interest and development. Um, and big tech is at the forefront of that discussion. Big tech is, is the area where people are, are uh, really, really focused on it. I was moderating a panel in Colombia last May on just helping smaller competition authorities uh, how to manage their resources. And even in like the smallest topics of like how do you manage a small antitrust enforcement agency, you know, in Norway or something like that, they couldn't stop talking about big tech because now the new thing is 20 years ago, everyone said, oh, the new innovation is to have a chief economist within the agency. But today, the big new innovation is to have a chief technologist inside the agencies to actually 
you know, be articulate in the way that we are examining these issues. So even just in the, like, the composition of these agencies, technology is just really at the forefront. So I only have 10 minutes and I have like a half dozen things I want to talk about, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover all of it. So I'm going to go really, really fast and then hope that the Q&A will circle back to some of these topics. So here are the kinds of issues that are really, really hot topics right now. And again, this is not only in the United States, this is in the rest of the world. Um, but it's certainly migrated to the United States. One is, what is the role and the purpose of antitrust law, right? Um, and traditionally, since the 1980s, the view has been it's been to focus on the consumer welfare standard, focusing on the, on the benefits that competition can afford to um, consumers and how you define that and how do you enforce that. That's always been the sort of mainstream view since the early 1980s. Um, today, there is a serious rethink about that in certain circles, right? Particularly in uh, the Democratic Party, there is a massive sort of rethink about is the old way that the Clinton administration and the Obama administration did it, is that the right way to do it or should we really be more aggressive in the way that we enforce antitrust laws? And so there is a, there is a movement um, within think tanks, within political platforms, uh, within uh, a whole lot of policy shops uh, about whether or not antitrust law should have a broader role, uh, a, a, a public interest role is essentially the standard. So no longer focusing just on consumer welfare, but focusing on uh, public interest. Uh, they harken back to the 60s and 70s as their, as their slogan to want to say it's not really new, it's actually old. You know, this is what we used to do in the 60s and 70s. Um, and that obviously has huge ramifications for uh, big tech because a lot of the evils that they're concerned about are associated with technology. Things like, like privacy, uh, issues about political influence or corporations, uh, the, the power of technology companies to impact our decision making, our elections, our uh, behaviors. There's a huge amount of interest in that. And there's a lot of appetite in the, in the sort of um, war and wing of the Democratic Party to sort of, let's say, let's really focus on that as part of our analysis. Thus far, it has not gotten traction in the courts, and it's not gotten traction in the enforcement agencies. The public interest standard has not gotten traction in the United States uh, by, by actual enforcement agencies or by the courts. Uh, but, you know, who knows what happens with the election if there is uh, uh, a win on the Democratic side by someone that has an appetite for that, uh, and they appoint an assistant attorney general of that persuasion, then one can imagine that there will be an effort to push that. So that's one of the big, big changes is uh, a rethinking of the consumer welfare standard. There's also a rethinking within the consumer welfare standard. So there is this debate about, okay, consumer welfare standard is focused on what benefits consumers, but we have to focus on that in a broader context rather than in a narrow context of just price effects, right? So now there's a massive new push. There's Alden Abbott. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> um, uh, there's a massive new emphasis and push that the consumer welfare standard should be interpreted broad enough to encompass things beyond just price effects. Now, that's not really a new idea. That's actually uh, a traditional idea, but it's really been a great emphasis and focus today. So, so you wouldn't say that the consumer welfare standard is interested in like protecting jobs for Walmart workers or things like that, but you would say that the consumer protection standard is broad enough to, to, to deal with non-price effects that harm consumers like privacy violations. In fact, Macon Delrahim uh, was quoted in the Washington Post just last, uh, late last year, although privacy fits primarily within the realm of consumer protection law, it would be a grave mistake to believe that privacy concerns can never play a role in antitrust analysis, which is another way of saying that consumer welfare could be um, a factor in the way that um, enforcement agencies decide to, to, to pursue tech companies, right? Uh, obviously, it's really hard to know how to do that because economists don't have easy tools to do uh, non-price effects. You know, how do you measure consumer harm in areas such as privacy or things like that, but it's definitely, definitely on the table. I also think it's not really talked about as much, but I think it is on the table, is that even if we're gonna embrace traditional uh, economic analysis in the consumer welfare standard, 
we need to bring antitrust law up to speed with the modern thinking about economics generally, right? Which is another way of saying I think that we're on the cusp of uh, behavioral economics being a part of antitrust law. I really do think that it's happening in other parts of the, of the world, but more and more as we're talking about uh, enforcement actions, we can't just talk about just neoclassical economic analysis. We have to talk about behavioral economics and what is the actual behavior of consumers within not just pure economic rational actors, but bounded rationality um, that happens in the actual behavior of consumers. And obviously the tech companies are acutely aware of that. I mean, they know exactly how to fashion the website that you experience so that you act in a way that is, they're nudging you in the direction that they would like. You know, the, the classic example is, you know, do you want to accept this? And it's either yes or learn more, right? And they never said yes and no. It's like yes or learn more. And then you have to go through like multiple iterations to finally get to the opportunity to say no. Uh, there's lots of examples of confirmation bias and status quo bias and uh, affirmative versus negative bias and things like that where, where when tech companies say competition is a click away, they know actually your click behavior, right? They know where to put things and how to uh, display things so that your clicking behavior will be modified in a way that is to your advantage. That's why I don't know if all of you have this temptation, but like you have like 10 seconds to not watch the next episode. Uh, like, why do they do that? Why do they only give you 10 seconds? Because they know that like, if they can just hook you into that first, you know, next episode, then you'll just binge watching. Your binge watching is not accidental, right? It's like, it's programmed into the way they do uh, streaming. Roger, so two more, two minutes. Okay, so that's the other big thing I would say, behavioral economics, I think, will be on the horizon. The other big thing is that antitrust enforcement of big tech is truly bipartisan, right? Um, I was uh, uh, at Notre Dame when Attorney General Barr came and spoke uh, to the law school, uh, and in the Q&A afterwards, I asked him specifically about, about the big tech investigation, and he said when he was seeking Senate confirmation, going around uh, on Capitol Hill, he said, we can disagree about almost everything, but the one thing that every senator agreed with me about was that we need to go after big tech, right? There is a amazing amount of consensus that um, there should that, that we need to really take a serious look at at big tech. I'm working right now with the Texas Attorney General's office. Uh, Ken Paxson probably doesn't agree with the New York or California T Attorney General office on almost anything. In fact, they're suing each other right now before the Supreme Court on their trade ban. But they are part of the alliance of 49 state AGs that are wanting to look at Google. And there's, a, I think, a 48 state coalition on Facebook. Uh, and there's broad, broad consensus uh, on the Republican and on the Democratic side that big tech is uh, a point of serious concern. And then the last big innovation, I'll stop with this, is um, the reinvigoration of the state AGs relative to the federal enforcers. I think that the Sprint T-Mobile was a watershed case in that uh, the Democratic state AGs filed suit to block the merger of Sprint T-Mobile before the settlement even occurred between the DOJ and the merging parties. That was a shot across the bow, essentially saying that state AGs are gonna be more aggressive on enforcement actions, even if it means upsetting the traditional balance between the primacy of the, of the federal enforcement agencies versus the state. So I think that's the last big, big change. And that's very much tied, I think, to the big tech initiative as well. I could say more, but I'll stop. I only got to like four. <laughs> well, we get some. That's an uh, open invitation for an enterprise exactly. student to ask you a question <laughs> today the about what the other things you didn't have a chance to talk about. So um, if you would, Jay, you will take us away now uh, for our second address. Okay, I want to see how this works. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation here. Um, I'm delighted to be a pinata if that's what this turns into. Um, so uh, I'm going to drill down a little bit into some of the distinct uh, uh, digital issues that are driving the discussion that Roger mentioned. Um, under conventional wisdom, antitrust um, is like an old Swiss army knife. It's really dependable. 
all the blades that you need are there. Uh, every once in a while, you pull one out. Maybe it needs to be sharpened, but in the end, you can do it all. It's flexible. I mean, that was the message that the President's uh, um, Economic uh, Council of Advisors uh, put in their report that came out just a week ago. Federal enforcement agencies have the tools they need to promote economic dynamism. As ongoing investigations and resolve cases show, they are well equipped to handle the competition challenges posed by the changing U.S. economy. That's the official position, and that's really the position that's expressed uh, by top-level enforcers and even by uh, legislators in Congress. Uh, nonetheless, in a, a lengthy report last year, the UK's uh, Furman panel, and Furman was a Harvard guy, uh, recommended establishing a digital markets unit in the UK to support greater uh, competition and choice and new legislation to empower that unit. Just this past fall, a committee uh, um, of the Stiegler Center at the University of Chicago similarly called for a new digital uh, regulator, as well as a specialized antitrust court. Um, the chair of the Stiegler Center is uh, our, uh, Stiegler Center committee was Fiona Scott Morton, who was a uh, former uh, assistant attorney general for economics at the DOJ, and she has written. Uh, when it comes to digital platforms, antitrust is rife with difficulties. Uh, the challenge to enforcement arises after 40 years of effectively walking back on antitrust enforcement. Now in order to catch up with our own economy, we need to develop tools and standards for a new area while we're on the back foot. Now these are comments you know, from thoughtful individuals. They're not people on the campaign trail. They're not even uh, legislators vying for votes. Uh, and as Professor Yu said, they are the kinds of concerns that are being expressed worldwide, where really wherever you find serious uh, competition law enforcement. Um, so let's, let's discuss a few of these features of the digital world that make it, um, in my view, somewhat different. Um, first of all, the digital world is characterized by network effects. Uh, platforms regularly connect two or more user groups, and the more that one group uses the platform, the more valuable the platform becomes for others. Now, you may have heard that in these circumstances, markets tip. Uh, there's a point at which the competition is for the market, not in the market, and, and dominance uh, emerges. Now, network effects were recognized long before there was a digital world. Um, but here there are an array of, of circumstances or conditions uh, that come together, and they're somewhat unusual in that they do come together um, and are not simply found in individual uh, kinds of economic uh, activity. You have, first of all, very high fixed costs. Yeah, it costs money to make a Google uh, or an Uber, but um, once you do that, the, there are very low, sometimes near zero, uh, variable costs. There are also low or near zero distribution costs for digital uh, features and you can reach an audience globally. The opportunity to acquire and monetize user data uh, is uh, another feature that you find here existed in the past but you can compare the old time um, Nielsen sweeps which occurred you know for a couple of weeks in March to what Google is doing every second of every day around the globe. Um, there's a corresponding ability uh, to offer zero price products online. Again, zero price products are not new, but I want to talk a little bit more about those. Now, um, these conditions in general favor rapid expansion of the user base. The reason for that is that if you rapidly expand the user base, Costs can be spread over uh, a wide variety of users. Uh, returns on investment become increasingly greater, and although venture capital is needed uh, to launch the platform, expansion is fueled by user data and user attention, data having been described as the world's most valuable resource today. Uh, not only do platforms uh, have economies of scale, 
uh, as their user base expands. They also develop economies of scope. What that means is they can periodically offer an expanding menu of features and products by permitting platform access to complementary uh, products, and that makes the uh, platform increasingly attractive to users. That access arrangement, however, doesn't necessarily persist permanently. Professor Yu, uh, commenting on Microsoft during its heyday, uh, makes this point, and he said Windows was a place where you were invited to dinner and wound up being dinner. In other words, platforms decide whether to acquire emerging competitors, thereby expanding uh, the scope of their offerings and attractiveness to users, or they can expand internally. Uh, having seen what's attractive that's out there. Um, this has been called the platform as a petri dish phenomenon. Um, now, um, let's go to data. Data is uh, an asset, clearly an asset. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Uh, there's a big debate whether the acquisition of data is a privacy issue or simply an antitrust issue. Um, I'm going to argue it's an antitrust issue in part, certainly. Um, data uh, uh, gives the opportunity to acquire knowledge. Knowledge is power. We've known that long before the digital world existed. And knowledge enables uh, opportunities to act. So data helps drive businesses um, in the real world in deciding how to behave with potential competitors, customers, suppliers. That's the essence of the competitive process. What are you going to do with those groups? And in my view, that's why I think we have to look at acquiring and using data uh, as a concern of antitrust law. Another distinct feature, and, and Roger touched on this, is user, user lock-in. Platform-specific technology disincents the user from leaving the platform even if a new and innovative competitor emerges. If you own an iPad or an iPhone, you've got a bunch of great apps. You can't take them to an Android phone that's manufactured by Samsung or LG. Uh, you, have to, you have to find the counterpart apps that are written for Android. You can install them, may do just as good a job. There's a little bit of a learning curve. You have to reconfigure them, that sort of thing. But those are examples of user lock-in. This is the vertical echo garden uh, that you heard, or the ecosystem, the, the paradise garden that you heard about before. User lock-in uh, is reinforced by interoperability constraints. Interoperability is the ability of two systems to talk to each other, to work together. You see it with your telephones, you may have a Verizon wireless phone, you talk to AT&T, that's interoperability. Well, online uh, features don't work that way. Uh, there's a lack of um, interoperability and there is a lack of data transfer from one, uh, one platform to another. That's called portability. Um, dominant platforms uh, develop an immense trove of user data. You think about it for a minute. It's, it's social graphs, friends, uh, websites, visits. Behaviors like clicking, liking, even hovering, uh, daily habits, local information. Uh, all the content that you've received or sent, two minutes, boy, you're going to really cut me off. Okay, <laughs> all that stuff won't transfer easily, and that lack of portability isn't accidental. Those platforms are incented uh, to keep uh, users on site, harvesting data, making more money that way. Uh, I'm going to really just skip, since you've given me two minutes, uh, we'll talk about acquisitions briefly by platforms. This has been a subject that's been talked about in the news. Uh, if you look at uh, the graph, you will see a chart that appeared uh, in, in Bloomberg uh, last week, I think it was. Uh, there have been uh, on the order of 400 acquisitions by those five companies uh, over the last decade, nearly 250 in the past five years. Now, most of those acquisitions never hit the antitrust merger guidelines uh, in the United States and equally so uh, in the major nations abroad. Even uh, where they do hit the guidelines, cases are, um, are virtually non-existent. The DOJ brought one case against Google uh, that, of course, was settled immediately uh, by a consent decree. Last month, the FTC confirmed 
that it's seeking documents to examine retrospectively uh, these mergers that didn't make it uh, 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 to the Hart Scott Rodino thresholds. Now, uh, what about this? Companies that lack positive earnings are purchased for generous premiums. So I think one can fairly ask whether the premiums paid are uh, ac acquirer desired innovation or acquirer desired de death. Um, we typically think of merger reviews that the agencies do as focusing on price effects. Again, this was mentioned, that doesn't work very well where the prices uh, are for zero price products. Uh, the economists don't really have a handle on dealing with that. Uh, you can try to measure uh, effects on innovation, but that is a really murky uh, sort of place to be. There are relatively few deals that ever get killed uh, for limitations on innovation, uh, uh, innovation after the deal, and mostly those are in the pharma areas where you can identify specific, specific innovative efforts toward particular kinds of conditions. Other than that, you wouldn't find uh, cases that are decided, merger reviews that are decided on uh, reduction in innovation. So uh, today, buyouts uh, rather than IPOs are probably the off-ramps uh, for new ventures. Uh, insofar as that occurs and, you know, innovation is constrained, uh, major platforms are able to shape the direction and pace of innovation in the digital world. Uh, there has been a suggestion these days uh, to uh, shift the burden of proof in merger reviews, uh, putting a burden on the merging parties. I think that's an idea worth exploring. And uh, so, I want to just show you uh, a picture uh, that comes out of an OECD report several years ago. This is the digital space, and um, it's pretty darn complicated. It's a lot different than what we're used to looking at, and that suggests to you that maybe we do need to have a different level of thinking about how to deal with competition issues in something that looks anywhere near like that. So. The answer to the question, I do think we need to rethink. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Uh, and forgive me for keeping you on time. It is one of my few jobs that I'm uh, charged with doing as moderator. So um, I will, uh, the only saving grace is that it allows us to preserve more time for you to interchange with each other and discuss with students. Salil, sure. without further ado, take away. All right. So again, thank you um, to the Federal Society for uh, bringing me in here and hosting uh, this great conference. It's a great topic. I mean, when I, when, I, um, when I saw the topic, do we need to rethink antitrust or big tech, I thought, boy, we only have 90 minutes for this. Um, I will say that um, before I get started with all this, you know, Pro Professor Yu's kind introduction talks about titles. I think you always want a good title, and I think there's a better one. Your Professor Hoffman, who used to work with me, teaches contracts, you know, you've all studied puffery. He has an article entitled, The Greatest Puffery Article Ever. <laughs> I think you're not going to beat that, but, um, but, but try. Um, so in part, the issue is this ready, fire, aim idea that Professor Yu has pointed out. And I think we're not, you know, you do run into that idea sometimes with enforcement agencies, particularly in newer regimes where maybe antitrust is not as uh, interwoven with economic analysis. I think here, though, in our own, econo in our own antitrust world, we're really in more of a ready, um, let's calibrate, build and calibrate a scope, and then we'll aim, and then we'll fire. And I think we're in that second stage right now. Because I, I think you can see, if you think about sort of traditional antitrust, right? Traditional antitrust concerns. You know, two of them are, are collusion and exclusion, right? So collusion, I've written a, a little bit about this, and I'm not going to rehash it in, in great detail, but it is theoretically possible, and it may in practice be possible, there are cases now, um, that collusion will become easier because of the quicker, easier availability of data on prices and, um, and, and markets. In other words, that firms that firms that are always weighing, oh, do we collude or not, if they can figure out if their counterparty is cheating or defecting from the collusion, they will, it will make the collusion more stable. So that's the first thing. Second one is ex exclusion, right? And this is, I think, an interesting problem, right? And it goes to this question of why we are building and calibrating uh, and recalibrating, right? If you go back to sort of the, the sort of the dark ages of Chicago School Antitrust, right? So like 40 years ago, 
the, the sort of dominant argument really is almost out of the Econ 101 picture of a monopoly, right? Um, so, you, you know, you, you, many of you will remember this, right? Like a monopoly, right, will transfer um, surplus from the consumer to the producer, but there'll also be the deadweight loss triangle. If you assume, right, that they can't, the monopolist cannot price discriminate, then it's not possible for the monopolist to pay the consumer to stick with the monopoly because the, the shift plus the day weight loss uh, triangle is bigger than what the monopolist has acquired through the shift in consumer surplus to producer surplus, right? That is, that's like part and parcel, that's like basic to it. But the question is, is that really all that's going on now, right? Um, you know, in the 90s, we start to see these sort of models that were often cr critiqued as sort of exotic about things like cheap exclusion and raising rivals, rivals costs. And the question is whether we're actually seeing some of these <coughs> models being put into effect now with some of the businesses that we are not as used to, right? People talk about the um, sort of these models, these two-sided uh, platforms or two-sided market models that are um, you know, paid for essentially through advertising or data acquisition. They're, you know, in terms of money, they're free to the consumer, but they're, you know, they're, they're not free in the sense that there's no valuable consideration, right? Um, and so we're still grappling with this, right? How do we deal with these, um, with these types of models. You can kind of see it. I don't know how many of you will have studied uh, or read recently this uh, opinion in Ohio versus Amex, um, but you know, your own uh, Professor Hovenkamp has written sort of drawing and building on, you know, former antitrust law professor Stephen Breyer's dissent, right, about how non-economic the argument is there, right, about how it doesn't really fit with economic analysis. And that's in part because it's just not a very familiar model, right? Um, but we're building, we're, we're building. Um, the other thing I would point out too is we often have this this sort of we've built on these sort of assumptions that are start increasing I think a little bit out of date, right? So one of the, the responses you'll often hear is you know that competition is a click away, right? Um, so first of all, most of us don't have a mouse anymore, right? We're using a <laughs> phone. We've got little touch pads on our laptops. So you know soon you're going to be using your eyeballs. So you won't be clicking anything. But but that's just semantic, right? Um, but the other thing about it, too, is, um, you know, people will point to the same examples, right? Like how Facebook displaced MySpace, right? But no, right? Is the reason that happened simply because the then owner of MySpace, Rupert Murdoch, didn't realize he should just buy Facebook. Because that's what Facebook arguably did with Instagram, right? And, you know, part of the argument in that when the government greenlighted that merger was, oh, everything is attention. Right, so there's just a market for your attention. You know, it could be everything: the NFL, the NBA, it's all attention. We we now know that that's probably not right, um, and we're starting to figure out how to um, how to recalibrate antitrust so that you know Facebook Facebook can't just buy nascent competitors, or at least not do it that easily. Um, the last thing in terms of traditional antitrust. Um, discussions that I want to point out, out is what I think both of our other speakers have capably and ably um, discussed, which is this idea of, of data and data privacy. I think there's, you know, I think it's too easy to say that all of privacy is an antitrust concern or that none of privacy is an antitrust concern. I think more likely there's a tremendous overlap. Um, sometimes privacy is something that could be supplied to you as a kind of product, right? You, you buy the same product and the question is how much privacy do you want with it? Right. Um, if you think about, for example, uh, the blocking of the LGBT data app, app grinder by the CFIUS, right? That's an output. Like, how much privacy do you want with that? Do you want it to be acquired, or the data store to be acquired by, you know, a company that's partially owned by the Chinese government, or not? Right. So that's a question. It could be an output. It could also be an input. Right. Um, you know, if you think about how you improve certain services, knowing more and more about your customers can be an input into providing a better service. So I think it's, it's, it's definitely something to reconsider and to think about going forward. I will point out too, since um, people have, have pointed out sort of the uh, relationship to whatever you want to call it, democracy, elections, governance, that is not something that antitrust has been very focused on um, for the last century, 50 years, 60 years, something like that. But at any rate, right, it's worth thinking about some of the ways that antitrust and this takes us a little bit away from big tech, um, how it relates to some of the, um, the election and political and governance issues. 
Um, one of them is this idea that you see in, in, in really from, I think, maybe more from the conservative side of the spectrum, this idea that concentration of platforms is actually stifling discussion, right? Because Twitter can just sort of, you know, and, and, and does just sort of block voices, right? And, you know, the argument is, oh, you can just go somewhere else. How come that doesn't happen that easily, right? You might ask, why is why does a new Twitter just not um, pop up immediately, right? Um, so that's something to think about. Um, in terms of other issues that are related to not necessarily big data, but related to this sort of question of rethinking antitrust and governance, politics, etc. Um, so you can think about inequality, right? Which seems to be driving a lot of uh, concern, or at least discussion. And there are two different, I think, topics that are of interest, right? One is uh, increasingly, if you're familiar with what Eric Posner, et cetera, have been writing about, you know, this idea that we have increasingly concentrated labor markets. That's actually arguably a traditional antitrust concern, right? If, if you have a market and it's increasingly concentrated or even monopolist, right? Monopsonist, if you want to call it that, that's just a traditional antitrust concern. It's not necessarily that we need to care about inequality to deal with it but it does have an impact on inequality. The other is this common ownership argument. Um, if you're familiar with the paper from um, Azar, et cetera, and, and there's some other papers about it, that are basically that there, there seems to be evidence, and there's, you know, economists are dealing with empirical evidence and there'll be some back and forth. There seems to be evidence that um, ownership of, the, of competing firms by, um, for example, mutual funds or institutional investors um, dampens the uh, aggressiveness of the competition among those competing firms. If that's true, Josh Gans has another article that suggests that that actually, um, because shareholders tend to be more affluent, that's driving inequality. Again, we don't have to care about inequality to redo antitrust, but common ownership was one of those things that drove antitrust in 1890, right? The concern that if everything is owned by the same people, you won't see competition. So um, I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to your questions. But I hope that this is um, this is really a good discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Silvio. So before proceeding to some questions I'll have, uh, I was going to go back to Roger and to Jenny to give any re opportunity to reactions or comments on what other people said. Since you had the last words, Lil, I don't feel like I have to go back to you. So. That's fine. <laughs> we'll get you in the Q and A. Roger. Uh, just a few comments. One, uh, you've both of you have touched on issues that I think are also really becoming. Uh, uh, hot topics for discussion. Uh, I'll just sort of emphasize a few of them. Um, nascent competition is now a really big issue um, in terms of like, should the enforcement agencies think about doing merger reviews differently where there's nascent competition? Traditionally, that's been extraordinarily difficult to establish that there's a substantial lessening of competition in the apps where, where you're, how is there a substantial lessening of competition when the company that's being acquired is a nascent competitor, not an actual competitor. So traditionally, that's been a very, very difficult threshold to meet. And that's, you know, why, you know, Facebook and WhatsApp went through. That's why Facebook and Instagram probably went through. But there is an appetite, I think, definitely to look at that more carefully. Um, I don't know where that's going to go. Uh, I think the burden shifting, uh, there's been two iterations on that. One is uh, sort of revenue thresholds and like certain billions of dollars of threshold but that doesn't really make sense you know if you know if Amazon is buying Whole Foods in completely separate markets and it happens to be a multi-billion dollar merger it's really hard to say that that's anti-competitive right because what Amazon's really doing is pro-competitive in the sense of bringing all of their skills of delivery and distribution to the grocery market right that's a innovation. So if you just had like a revenue threshold, that would be difficult. If you have a market share threshold for burden shifting, that might be more plausible, right? That, that if there is a, if the merger would result in a market share increase of X, then there might be an obligation to, to shift the burden. That's very controversial. I think Klobuchar is the one that's most active in proposing that. I don't know uh, how likely that would be to actually get through. I think common ownership, the jury is still out on that. Uh, people analogize it to, you know, interlocking directorships of companies, and that's obviously, you know, a serious problem. But the common ownership issue is really in the early stages of development, because a lot of these giant institutional investors are not just buying, you know, all of the airlines, they're also buying companies that are, 
provide services to the airlines, right? Or that so there's like m m multiple different incentives that these institutional investors have. And is Fidelity really trying to sort of engage in conduct or Vanguard or whatever, engage in conduct that would increase prices for consumers in this industry or the other? And then the other thing that there's an OECD paper and discussion about this in which these authors present, but there's a lot of rebuttals to their present. You know, how do you deal with index funds? I mean, how, you, can, you, you can't really talk about common ownership issues in the index fund context, right? I mean, what does an S&P 500 index say about common ownership? Well, you're supposed to buy all of the companies that are in the S&P 500, right? So you have to, I think, make a distinction if you're going to do that between active management and passive management in the index fund context. Those are a few comments on that. Jay? Well, I'll just offer a couple of comments. Um, Roger referred to behavioral economics as becoming a uh, likely force in antitrust, and I would agree with that. I think there is a really a lot um, of learning coming out of that area in the last 20 years um, that rebuts the notion of uh, so-called rational or profit-seeking individual or company. Um, and, and a, a good example, I think, has to do with um, zero price products. And by the way, if you come away with nothing from what I said today, I would be very grateful if you would think of the things you get as not free but zero price. Um, and there's a big difference. Um, but uh, the behavioral economics studies and studies by others have shown that zero is not just another price on the continuum from one to zero to minus one. Minus one is where the supplier pays you to take the product. Um, it has a distinct attractiveness to consumers. Uh, and, and the experimental studies are, are pretty consistent on things like that. I think that the behavioral economics on um, biases and nudges, things sometimes called dark patterns, uh, as influencers of um, co consumer or customer behavior, are really important, and uh, I think you're going to see a good deal more about that. Um, on the notion, though, of antitrust being bipartisan, I'm not as confident as Roger that it's entirely that bipartisan. Uh, I read an interview yesterday um, uh, by Senator Lee, who's a Republican from Utah, and uh, he was pretty much in the regular mode of everything's just fine. Let the antitrust uh, enforcers do their thing. They've got all the tools they need. And um, I think there's a fair uh, constituency in uh, uh, certain uh, parts of the Congress for that view. Um, um, common ownership, I guess I am more skeptical perhaps than I should be as an interventionist-minded uh, antitrust person. Uh, the, the essence of common ownership is really this. The common owners want to maximize the profits of the industry as opposed to the profits of the individual company and that they do better by um, somehow or another affecting what the particip what their, what their um, companies in which they own shares do. But I mean, that's a really hard causal connection to ever develop. I've heard people argue it both ways. Um, the empirics, I think, are kind of, um, you know, go in both directions and they criticize that the, the commentators will criticize each other. I, I, I'm not sure that's the most important place to be these days. Nascent competition, um, Roger just mentioned. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really important. Um, and it's not, you know, um, it's not new wine, so to speak. Uh, Forty years ago, uh, there, there were cases that uh, dealt with what was called then potential competition. Uh, they were acquisitions of companies not in the market uh, at a particular point in time. We're, of course, talking about brick and mortar companies at that point. Uh, and there were antitrust cases uh, that dealt with uh, what was then called potential competition. Um, and there were doctrines that developed. They were pretty much forgotten. Um, in the years since, and there haven't been very many cases on potential competition. The FTC actually went to trial on one uh, a couple of years ago and, and lost it, uh, but uh, it was one of the few potential competition cases that have been brought in a long time. I suppose potential competition is a little different to the nascent competition in the digital space. I, c I can recognize that, but if potential competition is hard enough 
to proceed against nascent competition is probably even even worse. I mean, I, the the uh, uh, it's it's pretty hard, and, and I accept this, but I also think it's important. Um, it's pretty hard to distinguish or determine whether um, uh, Instagram uh, would have been a potential competitor of Facebook um, from the outside. You know, Facebook paid a billion dollars for Instagram uh, at the time. It, it's reported to have had eleven employees. Uh, now. <laughs> Facebook knew something that other people didn't know, I suppose, and they, you know, had data uh, that they could analyze, and they could see that Facebook had 40 million users and um, was competing probably more uh, with Twitter at that point in time. But um, they probably did know something to pay a billion dollars for it. Um, I'm next, not sure. The next size bidder was 500 million. Yeah, well. <laughs> they, paid, they paid a half billion premium. Yeah, well, so, I mean, you can see that companies were evaluating the potential there. Um, but nascent competition, I agree, is really hard from the outside. That's why I think I would I would sooner shift a burden uh, to merging parties in, in some circumstances to demonstrate the pro-competitive benefits that might come from a merger, and that would handle your Amazon Whole Foods situation, at least in theory. You would make Amazon and Whole Foods show that the vertical integration that was going to be developed there, or if you want, you can call that almost conglomerate expansion because Amazon is offering products for sale. Now it's got a food chain that it's offering products for. You, you might consider uh, requiring them to show where you have a powerful platform like Amazon that there can be expected pro-competitive benefits uh, and that they are uh, more important than the uh, potential limitations on competition that come from that kind of um, expansion. So I lied. Salil, please. <laughs> you lied and you never come back? Like yeah, no, I thought the better of it. I think the right thing to do is to give you a chance. So Thank you. I appreciate welcome. it. So, um, you know, I'm going to tell you a story. Hopefully it'll be a little bit interesting. So um, in, in the night, it's about music videos. So in the 1990s, and even before that, the DOJ did an investigation involving uh, MIDI music video licensing. So when MTV, MTV used to show music videos as opposed to um, reality television. You may have heard of this. Actual, actual videos of, of musicians, right, playing, whatever. And um, so MTV, when it launched, it was provided these at no monetary cost. Some would say free, right? Um, and they, they, they built enough of a following that they continued to get them for free, right? MTV in the United States, right? Meaning no monetary costs, right? Um, when cable expanded to other countries in the 90s. MTV, along with others, tried to build like MTV Europe. Some of these are successful. MTV Japan, MTV China, MTV Korea, etc. All the, the major record companies said, no, we are going to charge money for <laughs> these videos, right? And one of their arguments was, hey, how could we possibly provide anything for free? That doesn't make any sense. It's worth noting that the 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 key article for which Jean Tirole and, and Rouché, they won their no, uh, Tirole won the Nobel Prize, was published in 2002-2003, that era, for on two-sided markets and, and two-sided platforms. The music publishing companies were never doing anything that was quote unquote totally free, right? And we understand that now. And I think that's that ties into a bigger problem that, that I think we're gonna face as, as lawyers or antitrust lawyers, which is that and ties in also to the Fiona Scott Morton argument about we're on the back foot, but we have to we have to adapt even though we're on the back foot. There is these are complex problems, right? And you know whether it's the common ownership. If we do find out that active common ownership, like I'm not worried about fidelity that much or index funds. I'm a little worried about SoftBank, right? When they own multiple companies in the same space, multiple startups in the same space, like. Uber and it's some of its competitors. They've had investments in some of Uber's foreign com competitors. You might want to worry about that and think about what sort of presumptions you have to build. Um, this idea of a burden shifting in merger investigations, I think, is a response largely to a federal judiciary that maybe has swung too far in asking the agencies um, to actually almost prove harm, right? to block a merger, right? Not substantially likely or anything like that, but almost prove it. If you read some of these opinions that have come out, like if you read you know, the more the tone than anything of opinions uh, like the one in, in Sprint and T-Mobile, or even <laughs> while I, I'm not a big fan of, of aggressively 
going into vertical mergers. Even um, the AT and T Time Warner, there's definitely a, 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 an almost a, a sort of a, 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 a very strong presumption that the government must prove harm, which is not exactly what the statute reads. Um, so I do think that in some of these, like just as a, the problem is going to be that the when we build whatever we're going to build in terms of presumptions as lawyers, because we're really about um, sort of dealing with the epistemology of these problems, it's going to be complicated. But I don't know that, that, that the fact that it might be a little more complicated than simply saying, oh, um, you know, do nothing, I don't know that that's necessarily the worst thing. So, can, can I just say something about, uh, you know, the judiciary's held the government to high standards? Sure. So, I mean, because... Yeah, I think that's the agencies uh, are also uh, responsible for that in their guidelines and the tests they put themselves through. Okay. Um, just one quick comment. Just I'm looking at Neil Chilson, who will be moderating the next panel, who was chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission and was legal advisor to Morning Olhausen. One of the things I would characterize as zero price is this is advertising support. Right. And that's one of the views, points of views the FTC took. And one of the, my pet peeves is um, I actually began, if you want to see how old I am, my first paper was on broadcast regulation, which was an entirely advertising supported business. And we actually have a whole economics to understand how those things work, which we sort of lost. And frankly, what the two-sided market literature says, the content providers paid people to take their content. Mm -hmm. And that was good because they made it back in advertising and then something. So understanding how these networks work, we've lost a literature that actually is very vibrant on how advertising works. Well, you, you, you said it well at various conferences. You said yeah. if, if something is free, it doesn't mean it's free. It means you're the product. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I want to, um, there's a, a weird, um, it, for purposes of this conference, there's a weird elephant in the room that no one has said the word neo brand IC and antitrust or hipster antitrust. And so I, I'm going to say, to it. I alluded to it. you alluded to it and, and Salil did. So for those of you who know, one of the big conversations happening right now, it is now orthodox under US law that it is about economic considerations that matter in antitrust. There, is, there was a tradition in the 50s and 60s, uh, some of in the 70s, of taking into account some of the, the issues that so the Professor Mayor mentioned, uh, free speech concerns, um, inequality concerns, which are directly about consumer welfare, low prices, higher quality products, and the like. There's a movement that uh, the supporters call neo-Brandeisian, picking up the notion from Brandeis that big is bad, or the curse of bigness is his famous article, and uh, which detractors call the hipster antitrust movement. Um, I gather from uh, what Roger and Jay are saying is that your, your arguments are very much in the economic tradition. And uh, Professor Mary Salil, you're actually making some nods to the non-economic tradition. Uh, I've been miscommunicating, I'm afraid. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I would, I would like you to talk about handicap. Predict what's going to happen with this. What do you think is the next phase? Because, for example, the American Antitrust Institute, which is one of the more pro-enforcement people, has come out against this movement. Yep. And so it's kind of, I, a lot of people scratch their heads. And they want, um, I, we have three experts here I thought I'd ask you. What is the future hold? Do you want me to go first? Sure. Sure. So, um, so the neo-Brandeisians, I think they're most associated with considering whether we should have a broader standard than consumer welfare. Uh, and we don't necessarily all agree on what consumer welfare means, which is not not a great thing. I don't think anyone can defend that as a as a as a situation, but they are they would encompass things um, that are maybe non economic concerns, concerns for labor as labor, um, concerns for um, I'm trying to think of some of the others, almost a Jeffersonian idea, not just Brandeis, but Jeffersonian idea of um, sort of building a stable middle class through certain types of policies and antitrust. So I don't go that far, obviously, from what I was talking about. I, I point out that, you know, there's no reason not to enforce antitrust if you think a labor market is being concentrated or, God forbid, even, you know, if collusion is going on in a labor market. Uh, we saw very light punishment of in the non-poaching, um, uh, Silicon Valley non-poaching case, right? Will you explain what non-poaching Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> basically, the idea was that the um, major Silicon, several major Silicon Valley firms were found to have agreed not to uh, hire away each other's employers, employees, especially sorry. Engineers, yeah. Yeah, especially engineers, right? Can you imagine if your law firm, you go to work for a law firm and the law firms in your town made this agreement? Shouldn't they be punished? I mean, it's a classic antitrust 
price fixing cartel. It just so happens that the victims are workers and they're selling their labor. They're not, you know, consumers buying a product, but it's it's just as bad, right? Um, but the punishments were really light in that case. And I think some of these things will address the things that are driving the neo-Brandeisians, like uh, inequality. I do wonder about the one thing that I think could have some bite that the neo-Brandeisians would point to uh, might actually, going forward, might be this kind of, uh, it's almost a throwback to the uh, broad, you know, Professor, you brought up the, brand, the broadcasting, almost a throwback to the whole um, uh, fairness doctrine kind of idea, but you do see this, right? You see, like, um, you know, some of these big platforms just sort of blocking um, certain speakers. And I'm not saying let's all provide access to every everything out there, but some of these speakers are not exactly, you know, I don't know what you would call them, information terrorists. Um, I, I don't know what the right term is for it. If there is a, a pale that you can be beyond, it's not clear who should be drawing that or where it should be drawn. And I wouldn't be surprised, it might not be antitrust, but I wouldn't be surprised to see us come back to that in some regulatory fashion. So I can just very, I mean, I already alluded to it, but I think the answer is the, the neo-Brandeisian movement is only an academic and policy and political discussion right now. It's not a litigation strategy. Um, if you ask the people that are in that camp, okay, what did your litigation shop say about this theory of going beyond consumer protection uh, and there is well we got to we want to win and in order to win we have to live with existing jurisprudence and the existing jurisprudence doesn't embrace that right so I just don't think that the litigation arm of that movement has really attempted to do anything close to what uh, is being proposed if it were to happen it would be in only two contexts one New York State AG or California State AG efforts right that would be the kind of thing that might happen in that context or, you know, if the left wing of the Democratic Party wins the presidency, you have a new AAG that would be willing to maybe try that. And they would try some over enforcement efforts that would go beyond the traditional standard. But, you know, they still would have to live with the existing jurisprudence that district and appellate courts are going <coughs> to apply. So um, I think the better answer is what you said at the very, very end, which is like those issues probably need to be addressed through consumer protection laws or, you know, Alden at the FTC does both consumer protection and antitrust, there are other places to deal with some of those issues. Um, I, I said I must have miscommunicated if I s suggested that I was um, in the core of uh, centrist antitrust today. I, I do think that over the past 40 years, um, antitrust has been overly captured uh, by the economists and um, that a reset that requires um, more lawyering and more lawyer attention to facts and all kinds of facts uh, would probably be desirable. Um, I don't. I don't suppose anybody was at the NYU conference on Friday uh, about the tech world. Anybody? Uh, the keynote speaker was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, and um, he was unequivocal. Bigness is bad. Uh, there are some things. Let me guess. It was Stiglitz. No, it wasn't Stiglitz. He was on another panel, however, <laughs> uh, who, who pretty much uh, uh, agreed with that. It was Paul Romer, as a matter of fact. Um, and um, his, his comment basically was there are some things that um, are bad in society and government has to deal with them. And um, he, he really uh, was adamantly uh, opposed to the current state of affairs as far as uh, digital uh, power is concerned, particularly Facebook, um, where, um, I mean, the question he put was, how many of you think Facebook uh, could actually influence the next presidential election? I mean, I think it's a fair question. How many people think that? That's pretty awful, isn't it? Uh, to think that one person uh, in control of one company can accomplish something like that, and if they can accomplish it here, they can probably accomplish it globally. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, do we really want uh, to have that kind of society? Now, I, I, I fully agree with um, uh, Roger that one of the problems, the way you call it hipster antitrust, new, new Brandeisian um, concepts, is um, that there is a body of law that's developed over the past 40 years uh, that is increasingly restrictive of the scope of antitrust law in this country. 
Um, and not only is there a body of law uh, there, but there is also a, a federal judiciary that is heavily influenced by the last three years of presidential appointments, uh, which built up uh, because uh, there were not uh, judicial appointments that um, were moved along in the last year of the Obama administration. So you have a judiciary that um, is of a particular mindset as well. Now, um, th those are realities. And so uh, where, where do you look for solutions? Uh, <laughs> You, one would say, well, of course, the legislature, but um, that's almost a, a joke, too. Um, so you, you do have to worry, and maybe there, there is some opportunity for the states uh, to accomplish things, but it's a, it's a long slog, and uh, uh, we didn't get to where we are today or, uh, on any short term. I mean, Bork planted seeds, and, you know, big ideas grow from little seeds. Uh, and even Bork's, you know, ideas were at that point, you know, probably being repackaged from 10 years earlier. So, um, I mean, that's kind of, I think you're facing a long slog through the courts uh, eventually. If you are going to try to change things, maybe you can get some changes in, in the legislature under different administrations. Um, but um, that, that, I'm not sure what else you can do right now except uh, pretend that um, the issues that you're seeing don't, you know, just don't exist, and that's not acceptable. So I'm going to. It's interesting. You made a uh, passing comment at the beginning of your remarks, James, that Jay, that you may be the pinata. I've come to the conclusion sitting here. Actually, I'm dealing with three former enforcement officials, <laughs> and maybe uh, it's my job to be the pinata, okay. which is um, I'm going to start pu pushing this in uh, maybe a provocative direction. But what what I would say is. A couple things, but a couple reactions to what you're saying, which is, I'm stunned by Paul Romer saying big is bad, because that's not the way economists should think. Economists think in terms of optimality. I mean, if there's one force where it's always pushing that way, those policy solutions, don't, debates don't last long. Usually this forces some good and some bad, scale economies working on both sides. And one of my concerns about the tendency in antitrust is to take concepts and to turn them into one-sided concepts. So to pick on uh, one that Roger mentioned and one that Jay mentioned, Behavioral antitrust, uh, properly speaking, is Kahneman and Tversky found 14 cognitive defects. Behavioral antitrust is that we're not entirely rational, and that we have the endowment effect, we have optimism bias, we have exaggerate small risks, and these seem to be fairly general across humans. What Professor Wilkins and Ryan will tell you is bad testing will pick a bunch that favor the outcome you want to make and say these control. When inevitably there are ones pushing in both directions, and this is ultimately an empirical question that requires testing. Right. Uh, Jay, you mentioned network effects. If you read the original network effects literature, uh, network effects actually are ambiguous. Most importantly, when you're changing from one network to the other, you are creating benefits for the network you join that you don't internalize. But you also impose costs by making the network you're leaving smaller that you don't internalize. And that ultimately, if you read the literature, these should be empirical questions it is not true that digital markets are winner-take-all. I look at travel sites. They're not winner-take-all markets. We see an equilibrium of multiple ones. There's something else going on. And this is consistent, I think, in the 2010 merger guidelines with a largely empirical turn in a lot of antitrust. So I would try to push back on both of you, saying, yes, you've identified important factors, but aren't you really asking for empirical analysis more than a general concern that says this is pro-enforcement? I mean, I, I think that what, we, what I'm trying to suggest is that when they do the economic analysis, they shouldn't just do neoclassical economic analysis. The enforcement agencies should talk about these bounded rationality factors, right? And I think Vester does that to some extent when she talks about Google search and she says things like, people don't scroll down to page four on Google shopping. We just, that we just know that they don't do that. How do they know that they do that? Well, they're making claims about the behavior of like, even though there might be actual like better prices if you're willing to go to page four on your mobile phone, you know, but none of them, do, do you guys on Google Shopping go to page four on your phone to find out that amazing deal that's buried down there lower? She's making a claim that, you know, whatever might be there, we just know that the behavior of individuals. So what I, all I'm saying, I, I completely agree with that. You need to factor in all of the elements of behavioral economics that may cut in different ways, but I just wish that that discussion was in the antitrust world to a more prominent degree. And I, I think it probably will, right? But I mean, it seems like it's such an inexorable movement. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I would say that the network effects that you are seeing in the digital space today, and while I agree they aren't 
common to all digital offerings, are, are really um, network effects on steroids compared to what we saw in the brick and mortar world. Um, the problems of interoperability combined with the absence of data portability, the discouragement of concepts like multi-homing, which means can I use more than one email account and go back and forth and transfer data and things like that. Um, the ability of major platforms today to act, uh, you've heard it as umpire and player. Um, in addition, they're also the rules committee uh, deciding uh, what, what rules the um, uh, umpire enforces and those limit uh, the ability of other um, digital offerings to get access to the platform, to stay on the platform, um, and even when they get on the platform, uh, the ability of the platform to collect data and to monitor basically what actual or potential competitors are doing is quite different than existed in the, the, the brick and mortar world. Um, there, there is such a thing that some economists will talk about um, general purpose um, technology. And the idea basically is that not very often there are cataclysmic changes in the economy. Um, the, the steam engine is, is identified as one and the, uh, the rotary electrical motor is identified as another. Um, I, I've, I've read of the, the semiconductor uh, and uh, uh, together with binary logic as being another example of just a general purpose technology which has, a f has the ability to spread effects both um, horizontally and vertically and to develop feedback loops that um, will drive the entire economy. And it's not just incremental change. And I think we're kind of living in that sort of environment today uh, so that um, we have to be challenging conventional orthodoxy. So what's ironic, this is to me the real question about modeling. You're suggesting general purpose technologies is creating too much power in the giants. The seminal article on general purpose technologies was written by Tim, Bre Tim Bresnahan and Mark Trachtenberg. Mm -hmm. And his conclusion was, the people who invest in general purpose technologies create benefits to complementers, that positive externalities in the Lego speed that they don't internalize. And what it actually creates is not too much strength in the middle, but it actually starves platforms of resources. It, it means underinvestment in them because they create benefits they don't internalize. But you see them internalizing them today, I think. Well, this is an interesting question. And then you look at the, the contracts they do on top of it may be problematic, and that's where a lot of the analysis goes. But this is where the discipline of understanding the theory of harm really kicks in, is to understand the vector, and then looking at the numbers to see if they actually play out. Because it's a tough question in many cases whether they do or they don't. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left. I want to open the floor to questions to make sure students get a chance to participate. More like five minutes. Uh, we're going to 130. <laughs> five minutes. 125 will cut off. OK. We have eight minutes. Anyway, Jacob. <laughs> so listening to this discussion, I'm reminded of a conversation that we've had at other panels with a similar valence, which is about gerrymandering. And one of the responses to that that a panelist frequently says is, listen, no matter how stacked the deck is, voters will make their own decision. And you see you know, voters kicking people out of office when even in heavily gerrymandered maps. And when I listen to this conversation, I think about how 15 years ago, our monopolies were MySpace, AOL Instant Messenger, Blockbuster, Yahoo. Uh, but we're not really worried about them as the big players in tech anymore. Um, so my question to you is, what do you say to people who say, listen, we're just in a snapshot in time, other competitors will come up, and this is really all just overblown? I'm sympathetic to that argument. I mean, I was at that uh, event at the University of Chicago where there was all these complaints about, like, the sky is falling on technology, and Kevin Murphy basically said, I've heard this all before, right? And then he gave a long list of, of displaced companies. So I'm sympathetic to the argument that new technologies, new innovators, are, are going to arise, but you know that doesn't change the fact that the antitrust laws are there to monitor and to curtail anti-competitive conduct, either price fixing or monopolization. And monopolization might not permanently curtail a new entrant, but it could dramatically slow down the emergence of a new entrant, right? And antitrust law is concerned about that as well, right? So, I mean, 
that was a big discussion in AT&T Time Warner, which was like, they're really doing this merger, not just about uh, the big cable markets, but also all the, the cord cutting movement that is happening and all the new innovation on over the top uh, new entrants in that. And, and, and the concern that the DOJ expressed and lost was that this is about AT&T trying to slow down the offerings of content to these new emerging over the top, over the top cord cutting enterprises, right? And and we made that argument that that was part of the concern, but obviously didn't didn't prevail on that. But I, I I agree with you that it's very very possible that there could be new entrants. I mean, there are other counter examples. I mean, Google tried to compete with Facebook, very very seriously tried to compete with Facebook, did More not did not did not succeed, right? Uh, you can see it in cloud, right? There's a few key players in cloud, but there's others that are not really succeeding. But there's, you know, a genuine effort to make sure there's serious, vigorous competition in cloud. So there are examples of what you're saying, I think. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, this is this goes to the point I was trying to make earlier about, you know, that we have the sort of slogans like only a click away and things like that. And the reality is just much more complicated. I was actually gonna, I was gonna mention the, the you know, Google Plus being taken down. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the most, you know, the most valuable company on the planet or something can't, can't sponsor entry, right? That's, that's kind of shocking, right? Again, you know, when you think about, and you know, we talked about this already, but the Facebook acquisition of, of Instagram and WhatsApp, again, you know, to the extent that Facebook would displace MySpace, well, Facebook now, isn't going to get displaced if they can acquire these firms. Now you can say, well, then we need antitrust, but that's what we're arguing for, right? And so, I mean, I think the, I would also also kind of throw it back to um, thinking about interoperability, as you know, as, as was mentioned before. Um, you know, some of the world that we live in is because Microsoft faced the case it did in the late '90s and early 2000s, including the European Union um, enforcement actions, right? There's a reason why we weren't bundled in um, Windows phones and Zooms, Zooms, Zooms with our uh, with our desktops as we worked at law firms. We could have been, um, but I think or BlackBerry. Or, <laughs> yeah, right. You might not have gotten a BlackBerry. You would have had to use the the Windows BlackBerry or whatever it would have been, or the C, Windows CE model. <laughs> so it's worth thinking that it's a little more complicated. And, and you have to remember, in 2004, Symbian had 70% market share of the mobile operating system. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's an amazing. It's this is a great question. Let, let me say one of the things, by the way, that you probably don't appreciate. Uh, that we tried to do with the Microsoft uh, case, and I was one of the people that negotiated the settlement there and monitored Microsoft um, for about seven years after that, uh, was to try to make sure that Microsoft did not extend its desktop monopoly to the server space. Uh, and the, the, the way we sought to accomplish that was by requiring Microsoft to disclose um, what are called communications protocols that allowed non-Microsoft servers to communicate better with the Microsoft uh, installed desktop base. The Europeans um, used the same uh, technique and we had essentially 95% overlap probably in the technology we required Microsoft um, um, to disclose. What was the reason for that? Because um, one of the conditions we saw as emerging was the delivery of services from the internet, uh, you know, software as services concept, uh, which did not really exist at that time. You thought of all the applications on your desktop. You never would have thought of a word processing system being delivered from the cloud that was the point of the uh, communications protocol remedy. We spent untold years to get those documents into a condition that the industry could use them. Well, and I think we're really at a point where we should turn this off, but I think what you're asking, the question you're asking, Jacob, is a really interesting one, because it's pushing us in a much more empirical way, in my opinion. So there's some great studies looking at concentration across all industries. They actually discover, as much as we think we're complaining now, you compare it to like the early 20th century, it's much better now. And what you find is a steady decline in concentration until about 96, but there is a bit of an upturn now. And to understand what the relevance of that is and how we play that out is a really interesting question. We spend a lot of time talking about Microsoft. Uh, what's fascinating is there's a huge literature arguing about how much of the credit goes to the Microsoft remedy. And the slide I put up when I teach this is if you look at browsers and media players, which is the things that were the focus of the case, their share continued to grow after the remedy. 
until the advent of competition from Chrome and, I and iOS and all these other things, FaceTime and these other things. And so it's a, fa it's a great and a valid question. What really turned around that market? Because obviously we're not worried about the Internet Explorer monopoly anymore. Um, and what role did antitrust have in playing with that? Are empirical questions we need to ask before we assume that the remedies actually work? Can I, uh, one other quick Please. comment. I mean, I think that Americans generally love innovation. We're xenophils instead of xenophobes, right? And so, I mean, how many of you would just be all in on TikTok if you knew it wasn't owned by the Chinese, right? I mean, it, once all of you Instagrammers, right? And I'm a Facebooker, right? Because you're the younger generation. But when you become parents, your kids are not going to want to be on what you're on, right? They're going to want to be on something new because they're like, my, I don't want to be on my parents' platform. Um, so I think there probably will be new innovations um, but you got to remember, like uh, Bing has been trying to go after Google and the, the, the barrier to entry to a successful search is just absolutely enormous. So it really depends on the market. Right. And I think it's a complicated question. I hope that that's true, though. I would love for new income, new, new entrants to always be the solution to incumbent power. Well, it seems a good note to, say, to end on. Please join me in thanking the panel for a fascinating